This is our living room. Actually, it's the west end of the long hall. It's the nerve center and crossroads of all family activities. An intimate place and yet busy, and it belongs to all the family. Psychologically, when you cross that threshold, you feel that you're at home, that you're inside your own house. You can put on a robe and slippers and curl up with a good book. We gather here on all the climactic occasions, such as the immediate moments following the State of the Union message or another major address to the nation. We usually invite those who worked on the speech or who had contributed to the event. On those nights, this room has been filled. It has the same electric quality of a Broadway opening. After the performance, you're anxious to hear the reviews. Although we've had some thrilling successes and high moments of pride, there were some chilly moments too. But happy or painful, this is where the initial public reaction is seen by the president. And this is where his family shares this experience. This room is also a listening post for the tone of the day. When we have no engagements in the evening, I come in here with some of my work that isn't so demanding and wait for Lyndon to come home from his work. You can see his office from here. The lights may be on until 8 o'clock, or maybe 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock. Sometimes he doesn't come home to dinner until after midnight. It's not very far for a man to commute, but in terms of his responsibilities, there is a great distance from here to there. I recall being up here as Linda brought in her latest acquisition for her old book collection, and Lucy emerged from the kitchen with a pan of brownies she'd made. And at the same time, knowing that Lyndon was down there, only a few yards away. But the tensest nights of all are the lights on in the cabinet room and the television vans on Executive Avenue. Perhaps it was the crisis of the Gulf of Tonkin of the Middle East in June 67. But sooner or later, the lights will go out and then in a few moments, I will hear an eager voice down the hall call out, where's Bird? And then I know he's home, really home. Like the living room in any American home, this room has its personal touches. Bookshelves that reflect the individual interests of the family, old and treasured friends. One of the things that I am proud to leave as a reminder of our time here is the addition to the White House permanent collection of paintings. Thomas Sully's portrait of Fanny Kimball is sheer romance and I love it. This is our most recent acquisition for the permanent collection, Robert Henry's Gypsy Girl. The first painting acquired during our stay at the White House was Winslow Homer's Surf at Prout's Neck. I saved my favorite, the Mary Cassatt, for last. You can almost feel the love between the mother and those children. Look at that little girl. Is she wondering what the small child is going to mean to her life? It's such a dear painting. It seems to set the tone of the room. It's where the family shared so many personal and intimate moments where we felt we were in the heart of the house, really at home. Each of the rooms in the family quarters of the White House has a special personality, a distinctive mood. Here, the treaty room has a dark green velvety look. Its ornate decor reflects the opulence of the Victorian period. Right after the Civil War, this became the cabinet room for President Andrew Johnson. But it was President Grant who introduced this table, which so many succeeding presidents used to conduct the nation's business 
until 1902. That was when the country outgrew the second floor. President Theodore Roosevelt, who had six children and was not tradition bound, built the West Wing presidential offices, separating once and for all the family quarters from the day-to-day -day work of the chief executive. Many objects bring to mind earlier presidents. The torches of Andrew Jackson, this lamp presented to Mrs. Grover Cleveland, and this tortoise shell wastebasket of President Grant, guaranteed to attract the young boys who visit us. The chandelier has an interesting story behind it. It was designed for the East Room in President Grant's time, but it soon passed from room to room until it finally wound up gracing President Theodore Roosevelt's new office. Every time the door opened, it tinkled, distracting him greatly. He ordered it to be sent to the Capitol, and he was supposed to have said, put it in the vice president's office and it will keep him awake. And there it remained until my husband became vice president in 1961. During Mrs. Kennedy's renovation, Lyndon was instrumental in returning it to the White House, where it hangs today. This room has seen many treaty signings. In our time, I've witnessed two treaties here involving the geographic extremes of our country. The first was the Campobello Treaty, which made the summer home of Franklin Delano Roosevelt an international park between Canada and the United States. Behind this table, Prime Minister Pearson of Canada and my husband were seated, flanked by their delegations. I remember James Roosevelt and Miss Grace Tully, the President's personal secretary. It was a thrilling look back into the past. And then, from the northernmost part of the country to the southernmost, in October of 67, the Chamizal Treaty was signed here. Returning to Mexico, a small strip of land, long in dispute between our countries. What a feeling of goodwill there was that day. The Texas congressmen from the border districts were here and a delegation from Mexico. Everyone, I felt, was saying to himself, it's done at last. I can recall some other writing performed at this table, all that will never go down in history. I was showing my guests the rooms on the second floor. We entered the treaty room, and as I began my recital, I saw on the table some rather tattered notebooks and chewed pencils, a high school algebra, and a Latin book. It was evident that Linda and Lucy had discovered what I too would soon learn, that this room is mighty conducive to getting work done. Almost from the beginning, I've used this room to launch the projects closest to my heart. It's a good place to gather your committee or your group, talk into being a program, and get it moving. Most of our beautification planning was done right here. We took our notes on President Grant's table and our liaison with the outside world was this old French telephone made back in the 1890s. And then I know that one day when I walked through the finished Lyndon B. Johnson Library at the University of Texas, vivid memories of this room will come to mind for almost three years, our various library committees have met here, bringing in the chancellor and regents, architects, historians and archivists, and all manner of design exhibit people. Here, we have watched the library grow from just a germ of an idea to a real living repository of history. And so, a room that started out as a working environment by a succession of presidents still provides that very important function for 20th century First Ladies with a variety of projects. It is a working room, but like any room in the White House, it is also a collection of memories. To me, the yellow oval room is the loveliest room in all the White House. While our living room is homey and cozy, 
This room is formal and elegant, yet there is life here. It is warm and inviting. It is the one room in the White House where formal ceremony intermingles with family life. It symbolizes, in a way, the role a president's family plays while living here. But the personal life and the official duties are always closely related. President Franklin Roosevelt's bedroom was next door, and he would use this room as a sitting room and an office. For us, it has been the main drawing room. And on a winter evening, the fire is a magnet for good conversation. Traditionally, the yellow oval room has been used for entertaining and for receptions. In fact, this is where the first official reception ever held at the White House took place. Here, on a chilly January 1st, in 1801, John and Abigail Adams received the ministers from the first six countries that had recognized this brand new nation. And still today, this room offers hospitality to visiting chiefs of state. This is where we invite the prime ministers or kings and their wives for that half hour or so before a state dinner. The earlier part of the day is filled with honors and formal ceremonies on the South Lawn, colorful fanfare, sometimes a parade. This has always been an impressive experience, a responsibility. I go to the third floor before the occasion and look at the great map case and pull down Liberia, India, and then it is a high moment when the color guard enters the president escorts the wife of the visiting chief, and I, in turn, by our guest. For a year, the handsome Marine captain who led the group was Chuck Robb. He was terribly military and impressive. It was not until months had passed that I realized I might be looking at our future son-in-law. We have had so many wonderful, personal, happy times in this room. Here, Lyndon and I celebrated, just last year, our 33rd wedding anniversary. The cake that Linda planned hailed our time together one third of a century. What a day was our grandson's first birthday. In the end, the furniture didn't suffer one bit, but my nerves did. And then, there was the Christmas of 67. My husband was plunged into a trip around the world. Prospects were bleak indeed for a Christmas with the whole family together. I followed his headlines from Australia to Thailand to Rome. And then gloriously, he came home on Christmas Eve. That Christmas, we were seven. Two sons-in-law and a new baby. Unspoken was the thought that next Christmas Chuck would not be with us. It was a fragile happiness, like some lovely bubble. And I think the room must have sensed it, for it was never prettier. It was our first Christmas in the White House, a moment to catch and hold. It seemed to underscore my feeling that this house is only on loan to its tenants, that we are temporary occupants linked to a continuity of presidents who have come before us and who will succeed us. For only a brief time, we serve as the extension of 200 million people, holding their trust, working to fulfill it. <laughs>